Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, where we believe there is a produce mom in all of us. I'm Lori Taylor, founder and CEO of the Produce Moms. For 10 years, I sold fresh produce to over 300 grocery stores in the U.S. And today, my team and I are fully focused on inspiring people to eat more fruits and vegetables. This show is just one of the ways that we hope to inspire you and your family to eat more produce and live a better life. If you like what you're hearing on the podcast, join our community of almost 40,000 in all 50 states and over 30 countries by visiting theproducemoms.com slash subscribe. And be sure to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes. Thanks for being here. Enjoy today's show. Welcome back, everyone. It is a great edition of the Produce Moms podcast. We are all going to learn so much today. I'm extremely excited and very honored to welcome a woman that I recently met, actually, at one of our industry continuing education events, uh, the United Fresh Foundation event this year. Uh, We are welcoming Jenny Maloney. She is the Food Chain and Sustainability Manager at Bayer Crop Science. You're going to love this woman's energy, her passion for agriculture, her knowledge, her family's heritage. I mean, this woman grew up on a farm, a small farm. She was instrumental in starting the farmer's market in the Fresno area, and she's a mom. So welcome to the Produce Moms podcast. Jenny, we are so glad you're here. Well, thank you for having me. I had been listening to your podcast for a while, and I sort of fan-stalked you at United Fresh Start in January, so I'm glad it worked out. (laughs) I'm so glad it worked out. This is, you know, we've had uh, a couple great conversations since you texted me when we were both in our separate meetings and uh, meet in the hallway. I, I got to meet you. And I'm, I'm so glad you did that. And for anyone listening today, I mean, we say it in the closing of every single one of our shows, but if you feel like you've got a compelling story to share or a ton of passion on fruits and vegetables, we want to hear from you and you might be our next guest the way Jenny's our guest today. So um, Jenny, thank you again for being part of this. Thank you for uh, you know, your, your grit and your confidence and coming right to me and saying, Hey, I've got a lot of passion and a lot of knowledge. And I want to share the story of not only what I do as a professional, but what my employer Bayer Crop Science is doing as it relates to, you know, really the, the new face of modern agriculture. So I think we should probably start at the top here, you know, define your role with Bayer food chain and sustainability, two very important topics that we've talked about really extensively, almost in every single podcast episode, uh, you know, the food chain and sustainability gets brought up, um, you know, and, and for the, fo- the folks that are listening today that aren't familiar with Bayer, tell us more about your company. Sure. So I'm in what they call a food chain and sustainability role at Bayer. It's, it's unique. I've not really seen it in other parts of the, the ag industry, but um, uh, <clears throat> I work with what we call the downstream part of the food chain. So um, we do a ton of work with growers in the fields, with their agronomy team, with their certified pest advisors. Um, and um, and then we do a lot of R&D work before products are actually developed. But where I sit, I work um, with some of um, some vertically integrated growers or growers, but I then work with the, as the food moves downstream towards the consumer. So, Someone who may um, grow pack ship, uh, maybe someone who processes the food, um, and then grocery retailer. So I, those are my key accounts that I then work with, um, with an ultimate focus too on the the consumer. So what the consumer is asking for, what kind of questions they're asking, and then those things then drive the different activities that I do with various people within the food chain. So it's a really great role in that I get to look holistically at. It's not only how the food is grown in the field, but to the time it gets to the table of a consumer. Um, So that, and then part of that is looking at sustainability and um, not just, um, so if I back up a little bit, um, Bayer, um, who I work for, is a life science company. They've got more than 150 year history and their core competencies are in healthcare and ag, agriculture. Um, innovative products, and their focus is contributing to finding solutions to some of the major challenges of our time uh, by improving quality of life for a growing population, 
um, uh, focusing on research and development on preventing, alleviating, and treating diseases, and then also on the ag side, um, helping provide a reliable supply of high-quality food and feed. So some people may know us from Bayer Aspirin. That's one of our consumer health products, Claritin, Aspirin, Aleve, those, you may be familiar with them. We also have a pharmaceuticals division, um, uh, drugs like Xarelto you may have heard of. And then we have our crop science division, which is where we sit. We're, we're in 90 countries. We've got about 116,000 employees worldwide, 20% of them in the U.S. So we're a really diverse company, um, but with that common goal of um, um, contributing to the, to the betterment of human life. So um, at, um, in, in crop science in the U.S. and Bayer, I focus in on the fruit and veggie market. So my food chain and sustainability focus is in that area. Um, I, we have several products that we offer to growers. We sell through a dealer channel. Um, we have um, pesticides, which is a very big umbrella term, also known as crop protection products. Um, those are things that help protect a crop. So it could be an insecticide, which is something that helps prevent insect damage. Uh, it could be a herbicide, so something to protect against weeds, or fungicide to help protect against different fungus. And pesticides, this crop protection pesticide broad umbrella, um, Beneath that, too, you have synthetic, um, synthetically produced crop protection products and non-synthetic. So um, we could talk a little bit about it later uh, in terms of organic versus conventional production, but that's sort of the general umbrella. And at Bayer, um, we have a big focus in the fruit and vegetable sector. We, we do more beyond that, but my focus is in fruits and veggies. Um, that's fruits and veg all sorts of fruits and vegetables, including citrus, apples, grapes tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuce, sort of the whole gamut. So we are um, really active in um, sort of the smile states where a lot of that is grown um, and um, have a big presence in, in California and in the Central Valley, which is where, where I grew up as well. well that's, that's an amazing uh, snapshot at what a global and powerful uh, company is doing uh, in agriculture. And I will say, uh, you know, I, that everyone at Bayer Crop Science who's listening today, thank you for your hard work. I think all of us who fall under that, my job depends on ag umbrella, uh, you know, we couldn't do it without you all. So I really look forward to uh, diving into some of the work that you all are doing at Bayer Crop Science. And then also, you know, Jenny, really talking about this concept that you are, you personally are so passionate about the new face of modern agriculture. You know, you recently wrote a very powerful essay uh, blog on it. And, you know, let's, let's share your passion right now with our listeners. What's modern agriculture to you, Jenny? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm lucky that I grew up in a, um, with an ag background. I grew up on a small little hobby farm in Clovis, California. Um, but my, my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents have all been involved in agriculture. So I've been able to have this snapshot of what's gone on over the past, you know, hundred years. Um, my my grandparents um, on both sides farmed in um, on the Front Range in Colorado around the Alt Eaton area. Um, diversified operations: um, cattle, corn silage. Um, their cash crop was uh, sugar beets. Um, but um, they had a lot of different technologies at that time. And uh, my grandpa, one of my grandfathers, um, uh, born in the early 1900s, lived through the Depressions, was in his teens when the Depressions came through, and really tested their, um, them as, as farmers and growers and trying to figure out how to be profitable. He would tell stories about how um, there were people that would just sit on the edge of edge of the um, fields waiting for them to finish the potato harvest and just going in and picking out coals in the field. So really a much different time than we're in now. But um, the key thing I think is sort of, sort of juxtapose, you know, I have pictures of them using um, horses to do potato harvest. And um, as every year went by, not only the, the mechanization, the equipment mechanization, but advances in seed technology and crop protection technology to allow um, growers to, to really do more with less. And 
Um, back then, 30% of the population was engaged in farming. You know, today it's 2%. So you not only have a lot less labor <laughs> um, to be able to get the job done, but you've got uh, such differences now in land prices and input prices and labor costs and all these other things that growers are, are dealing with now versus what they deal with them. Different different challenges for sure, but um, being able to have that perspective and hear those stories from my family, it, it, it first of all goes to show how, how far we've come in terms of technology um, on how we you know, the production methods, but also really interesting things. Like I, I asked my dad, um, okay, so when, when you were growing potatoes, was it for potato chips or potato fries or, you know, sweet potato fries? And he's like, Jenny, no, <laughs> he said we were, you know, eating potatoes as a basic portion of our meal. We didn't have these things. So even from a, you know, a food development perspective, um, uh, the amount of, fruits and vegetables that we now have access to versus back then it was like in the summertime you could have fresh fruits and vegetables but in the wintertime you're probably eating pickled beets so um, I think that's really interesting too to be able to compare and contrast those things um, we you know in terms of new technology that we have now I mean we have now robots that can go through the field and um, maybe not commercially available uh, in, in all fruits and veggie crops, but they're, they're working on robots that can go through the field and through imagery, know what, what's a weed, what's a plant, what's a, what's a insect and be able to target those things as they go through the field and then use drone imagery to understand what happened in that field for the past three years. And then, um, looking at DNA yeah, soil samples. So all this different data that growers have now to really make, um, make better decisions on farm, which is just sort of one part of this food chain. Right. right. It is a, uh, a total convergence of tech and farming is modern agriculture, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> and it's amazing to see things like the, uh, the automated harvesters or, you know, the robots that you're referencing in the field. We have on our YouTube channel from, uh, gosh, and several years now, I was out in Salinas and I was able to see the plant tape technology. Uh, yeah. I actually wrote in the chapter with Brian Antle as it did its first pass and one of its first passes uh, in Salinas. And uh, that's the, um, the automated uh, transplanter that they have out there. So it is, gosh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing to see the development of uh, technology and modern day agriculture. And you know, as we talk about modern agriculture, Another thing that, again, you've, you've talked about this on your blog is, uh, you know, the, the forecast for women in this industry, women in agriculture, you know, and, and as we examine this new face of modern ag, we have to recognize the presence of females in the ag industry and how that compares to the past. Yeah. And, um, I, I was, um, when I was thinking about this podcast, I was talking to my parents about their experience farming. And my mom was telling me, you know, Jenny, when I was nine, I was driving a tractor and I was saying, well, that's probably not OSHA acceptable now, mom, but <laughs> back, back then that was okay. But, um, you know, traditionally, um, ro roles, I think were, were different, um, when my mom was growing up in agriculture and, um, now it is, um, I mean, the, the, the opportunities really are, are endless. Um, I spent a handful of years in Washington, D.C. I worked for the Department of Agriculture when um, Ann Veneman was first Ag Secretary and then Mike Johans. And um, the, the women that I work with, both within um, U.S. Ag, but also in some of the global ag connections that I had were just, just amazing. And I think, um, I think overall, um, you know, as, as young people are getting into agriculture, there are fantastic opportunities to do things. And it's not, I say in one of my blog posts, this is not your father's agriculture. This isn't my dad's agriculture. This isn't my grandfather's agriculture. This is really a, a new and innovative space. And you can do things related to um, looking at consumer trends on eating avocados and helping create marketing plans to 
get more people to eat avocado toast, or you can be on the uh, the breeding side for avocados and figuring out how do you get an avocado that ripens more consistently, or you could be in the field and, um, you know, running a farm and, um, you could also be on more the digital side, um, understanding crop weather patterns and, um, doing different programming to, um, give insight on, um, when you should harvest or when you should fertilize. So there's, there's so many opportunities in ag now, um, different than maybe what the traditional mindset was. So that's one thing that I think is so exciting for younger people getting into ag. Um, the second thing, when, when I have young women um, talk to me about, you know, what's it like being a woman in ag? You know, there are not as many women as men. Um, my advice to them is always, um, if you're eager, if you're willing to learn, willing to work hard, the opportunities are endless. Um, there are mentors within the industry that um, if they see someone that, that has that drive and, and willingness to work hard, um, you can, the sky's the limit um, for you as a woman in agriculture. And so I think um, it's, um, it's really exciting. Um, you know, I, um, our leadership team, we have a new leadership team within Bayer. I was just meeting with them earlier this week in St. Louis. And um, a lot of our top leadership, it's they're women. And um, so it, it, it's great. It brings, I think, having that diversity of um, gender, of thought, of age, all of those things help to really address problems that we face in whatever jobs we're doing differently. Absolutely. And, you know, another, another demographic that we need, to, we need to talk about today on the podcast, let's talk about kids. You know, uh, Jenny, when you and I met, we were at the United Fresh Start Foundation event, which is a foundation that's really dedicated to increasing the availability of fresh produce and the consumption of fresh produce among children. Um, you know, so let's let's talk about how this new face of modern agriculture, what, what are we doing today to get kids to eat more fresh produce? Because the current stats prove that right now we're not doing a very good job, you know, over eight. <laughs> of children are not eating the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables. So what, what are we going to do to change these deficient consumption behaviors? Well, um, I wish there was a silver bullet um, because I think the answer is it's hard. <laughs> um, I, so I have a one and a half year old and a three and a half year old, two girls, and I am in the fruit and vegetable industry. I love fruits and vegetables. I try and eat them as much as I can. Um, and I work really hard to try and get my kids to eat fruits and vegetables, but it is a struggle for, for someone who is pushing it every day. It is really focused on it. Um, I have a hard time getting my kids to eat fruits and vegetables. Um, this morning, uh, we, we, uh, we watched Bohemian Rhapsody. So we've been playing a lot of queen in our house and, I was, um, we had, we are the champions came on and I was changing the lyrics to, we are the champions to, we are the champions of breakfast and talking about eating grapes and pineapple. And so I, my daughter, my three and a half daughter actually did then eat the grapes and the pineapple, which I was so excited about. But I mean, those are pretty extreme measures, I think, to try and get your kids to eat fruits and vegetables. But sometimes you just, you do what it takes. Um, but I think um, in all seriousness, it is a multi-pronged approach. Um, it's, it's not just introducing kids to fruits and vegetables. It's doing things around educating them around how their food is grown, um, where it's grown, um, where does it come from? I mean, that really piques their interest. That's one factor that's important. Another is certainly the access portion. So um, one of the things that we partner with with the United Fresh Foundation is uh, salad bars. And we've been a big supporter of United Fresh and their salad bar um, program. Every year we donate um, uh, four salad bars. We pick a school district. We work with the United Fresh Foundation team and we pick a school district and um, it's through their National Salad Bars to School Initiative. And um, we donate the actual equipment that allows uh, some of these elementary schools to have a salad bar at their lunchtime because some of the schools don't, don't have that luxury to have the mechanism to put fresh fruits and vegetables out. So that's one um, area, just the access, the, sometimes the equipment. 
but then getting fresh fruits and vegetables in front of kids. I think making it fun for them um, and making it easy for them to eat. Um, and then also, you know, thinking about outside the school hours, um, whether it's at night, on the weekends, during summer or winter breaks. Um, but how do you continue to get those fresh fruit and veggies in front of kids? And the other program that we work with, with United Fresh, and I know you know their organization really well, um, is their community grants program. And really looking at during those times outside of school, how do you how do you get kids access to fruits and vegetables? So they've got a great new program that we also sponsor that um, companies can apply to to think about more creative ways to to get access. And again, it could be education. It could be uh, YMCA gardens. It could be um, uh, teaching parents how to how to prepare fruits and vegetables so their kids like them. I mean, I've I've been on different mom blogs and Pinterest and trying to figure out how do you hide um, kale and spinach into your kid's food? I mean, so there's some, I think, education there too, in terms of how is, how is, parents or caregivers, whoever's doing it, how, how do we get creative and get kids um, interested in, in fruits and veggies? So it's, I think it's a multi-factored um, approach. And one of the other things is making sure that it tastes good. You know, so if, if I'm going to get my daughter to, um, to try and eat cantaloupe, um, it needs to taste, taste good, you know, and have a good texture and a good flavor. And, um, I think that that's that's one of the components that on the seed side that we're really working on as well. But it is getting getting kids to eat more fruits and veggies. It's going to take a, a hugely collaborative effort by everyone in the industry to tackle all these different areas. Yeah, so let's I mean let's talk about that because that is so important. And you know, it wasn't really until my our our pre show conversations, Jenny, that I realized what all Bayer's doing as it relates to really, you know, increasing the consumption of fruits and vegetables by making sure we have the most flavorful fruits and vegetables uh, that can be grown. So tell us a little bit more about what you're doing at the seed level to improve the flavor of fruits and vegetables, because as we all know, it is not nutrition until it's eaten. <laughs> and you're not going to eat food unless it tastes good. <laughs> I'm laughing because I totally agree. I um, we we have a um, for background we we have a seeds division, so um, a Seminus seeds division in Deroiter. So Seminus is the the open air, open field um, fruit and veg for fruit and vegetable seeds, and then our Deroiter business is our covered agriculture greenhouses. Um, but we have a broad portfolio. We have over 2,000 different varieties, 22 crops, um, all the good stuff, broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, cucumbers, lettuce, melon, peppers, spinach, sweet corn, tomatoes, watermelon. So pretty broad portfolio of 22 different crops. Um, the majority of the vegetable seeds that we manufacture aren't GMO, but we do have a small portion that are our uh, sweet corn and squash. But the remainder of our broad seed portfolio is using traditional hybrid technology. So that's basically two parents, two parents going together and bringing forward different gene traits. So um, the whole process of determining what you're going to breed for um, is, is pretty complex. It can take to really get a seed to um, commercial viability. It can take eight to 10 years. So we think, and um, we want to, um, maybe a strawberry that has um, smaller seeds or a, um, a spinach with, um, with uh, cur curlier leaves or something. Um, from development uh, to commercialization, that's a fairly long process. And really what a company like ours does in the development is we have to balance different things. And I find myself sometimes talking, thinking just from a grower perspective or just thinking from a processor's perspective or a grocery perspective or a consumer perspective, but really you end up looking holistically about the needs of everyone. So growers have certain needs when they're growing a crop that are much different than what a consumer needs is. So if we talk about um, cantaloupe, um, 
We have a new cantaloupe variety called the Crave Melon coming out. You should see it in the summertime in most grocery stores. But our Crave Melon is a sweeter, um, better tasting, we think, cantaloupe um, than what you might find in the traditional market. Well, when you change some of these um, some of these gene traits, like having a sweeter um, sweeter taste to it, that can sometimes have the consequence of where you you have the shell of the cantaloupe that isn't as um, isn't as hard, is a little bit softer, and so. What you have to do then with some of these seed varieties is, is figure, okay, we need these certain characteristics so grower can actually grow it in the field and um, and harvest it and get the right yields and the size and, um, and whatever they're being graded for. But also, from a consumer perspective, if they're asking for certain things like sweeter tasting um, cantaloupe or maybe... Um, uh, smaller uh, tomatoes or maybe um, habanero peppers that aren't as spicy. So it is balancing the needs of both the grower and the consumer to try and as you're, as you're um, going through this process of developing the variety, getting them to what they want. There's been instances, we, we had a frescata lettuce that came out. It was a cross between a romaine and an iceberg. Uh, perfect for lettuce wraps. Um, had the um, uh, the same taste as a romaine, but a little more of the crunchiness of like an iceberg. Uh, but then when it got to the market, they didn't know what to do with it. And consumers didn't know how to use it. It was different to them. So there's also times too where sometimes if you focus too much on maybe what um, what we think might work with a consumer, but if there's not the consumer education behind it, um, sometimes the new varieties don't work out. But in general, it there is this really renewed focus on taste and how do we improve the taste of some of our fruits and vegetables? Um, you know, looking at things like onions, um, you know, how do you, um, what kinds of things can you do to lower acidity, but still have high brick? So it still tastes good, but, um, maybe you you don't have the crying portion of it. Um, and then there's, you know, we also have a, um, a garden seed division, a home garden seed division, and we've got a really amazing habanero pepper. Um, we used to, when I grew up in our little two-acre garden that we sold at Farmers Market in Clovis. We had we were specialty uh, pepper growers. We had every pepper you can imagine, everyone on the Scoville units, which Scoville is what measures the heat level of the pepper. And um, we would have people and um, coming through and. They were just used to buying bell peppers. They had no, other than like a Fresno chilies, okay, but um, habaneros and some of the other unique varieties, they didn't really know what to do with. And if you aren't experienced in hot peppers, you have to be careful. Yeah, so, <laughs> you sure can. Um, <laughs> You'll have an ER trip if you're not careful. <laughs> oh, I have a story about that in sixth grade, but um, we'll save it for a different day. Um <laughs> <laughs> um, don't try and impress as a second grader, don't try and impress your sixth grader um, brother friends by eating a habanero. Um, no, it does don't not do work. That. Yeah, it does not nope. work. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we have a pepper called the roulette pepper. Usually the pungency of a habanero is um, is going to be in between 100,000 and 350,000 Scoville units. The um, home garden pepper we have, the roulette pepper, the pungency is a hundred Scoville units. So you get mm. the taste of a habanero. So right. you still get that spicy taste, but you don't get the heat. So right. there's just some, I think just some fascinating things that we're able to do with some of this. Um, and that's, that's all the type. Those are all examples of the type of things you're doing at Bayer. Yeah. And you know, yeah. the majority of our business is going to be um, for fruits and vegetables that you find in the grocery store, like I said, you know, lettuce, carrots, melons, broccoli, but, um, but also we, we do have this home garden side too, which, you know, when we talk back about how do we get kids to eat more fruits and veggies, like great opportunity to get kids to grow their own gardens and really feel that closer yes. association with the food they eat. And that's the truth. So, <laughs> you know, you brought up something as you were talking about all of these developments and the work that you're doing with seeds. So let's reiterate real quick. Most fruits and vegetables are not GMO. 
Right. Most fruits and vegetables grown throughout the world are not GMO. There's a small handful of fruits and veggies right now that are, but it's, um, it's a pretty small percentage. Um, and there's different reasons for that. Um, some of it is uh, consumer preference. Some of it is just um, breeding technologies. The cost of um, GMO breeding technologies can sometimes be more expensive. But, but really, the majority of the fruits and vegetables that you eat in the U.S. are, are not GMO. Not that there's anything wrong with GMO breeding. I, as a new mom, I and with my mom friends, two of the main questions that I always get is, is it okay to eat GMO? And should I be buying organic? And of course, if it's organic, it's not GMOs, but um, not everyone knows that difference. And uh, my answer is um, both are safe. You, you GMOs are perfectly safe to eat. All the scientific studies show that there's, there's no risk to human health. And then on the organic or conventional side, again, um, safe to eat and really a lot of government testing that goes behind that to ensure the government, what the government does to ensure the safety of our food. So what my answer is, is it's a preference. You, you as a consumer should learn how your food is grown and eat what you're comfortable with and, you know, what makes you happy. Um, if you want a production method where they're using non-synthetic pesticides versus synthetic pesticides, you know, go for it. If if you get a cold, you may choose to drink honey and um, uh, lemon um, tea, or you may choose to go get something at the drugstore that's a synthetic version. So it, it's really just a personal preference. But in the end, they're they're all safe to eat. They're they're we should be consuming fruits and veggies no matter what. Right. And what a beautiful place we live in here in America where, where we have abundant choice. Oh, it's amazing. It is amazing. We had a, a friend from Germany, a, a young woman come and stay with us for a couple months and we take her to the grocery store and she just couldn't believe the variety and of the fruits and veggies that we had. And then the price we taught her, um, how to make guacamole, um, and then she went back to, um, she lives outside of Munich and she was telling me, Jenny, the avocados are $8 an avocado. And I, it cost me, you know, 30 euros to make, a, to make a bowl of guacamole. And so I told her, well, why don't you just save that money? You could buy a ticket to come out and visit us again. Right. Uh, yeah. No, but... The affordability, the affordability of fresh produce especially here in the United States is, I mean, it's really profound and, you know, and, the work that Bayer does here domestically and globally helps contribute to, you know, our year round availability of pretty much any fruit or vegetable we want here in the U S. So, uh, it's, it's amazing. And thank you, Jenny, for sharing all your insight, um, all of your insight on how you are working hard to at Bayer on the, on the flavor of fruits and vegetables. I love hearing that. I think a lot of people probably have no, a lot of our listeners probably have no idea that that's part of, you know, what you're doing at the seed level to really help increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. So, um, you know, and, and also I want to, I want to reiterate another really important topic. You said, you know, we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables. And as we, you know, the overall theme of today's conversation and podcast has been about this new face of modern agriculture. So how does that look as we compare these farming styles? You, you, you know, we just talked about organic versus conventional. So um, there are, and, and I know you've had some speakers before talk about um, organics versus conventional. Um, there are very strict standards in place um, if you're growing something and you want to obtain the USDA organic seal, seal, and that's through the National Organic Program. So sort of assuming people have some general background on all the things that you have to do to obtain that certification, the three-year waiting period, and all the other things that you have to go through. One of the main differences between um, organic and conventional production is um, use of synthetic uh, pesticides and fertilizers. So when you're growing um, for you at the USDA organic program, you can't use um, synthetic in general. There are there are some caveats, but they're fairly small. Um, you can't use synthetic pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. Um, so what that means is if you're growing organic, 
you're going to have to be um, really creative with how you deal with pests because depending where in the country you are, growers deal every day with pest issues. And it's, you know, I think sometimes it's, um, if you're in the field and you deal with it every day, you're like, yes, you know, I had a, um, uh, our, uh, this specific caterpillar that just decimated or this mite that did this, or, I mean, look at Asian citrus psyllid in, in Florida citrus, just the devastation that has occurred. So when you're, when you're in the field, you understand just how hard it is to deal with pests and the devastation that they can do. Um, I was talking I think to anyone our- who's, I think anyone who's had a backyard garden <laughs> also knows that, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was talking to an organic grower they grow organic in Colorado at the organic grower summit in December. And, and I said, you know, there really aren't any effective non-synthetic herbicides right now. So if you want to deal with weeds in organic production, um, you're going to have a lot of hand labor. You're going to be picking weeds. There's tools out there, but the efficacy right now of some of the non-synthetic products is just not where the synthetic products are. So you don't have the same control. Um, so you're doing a lot of hand weeding. And I said, well, what if you just let the weeds go? I mean, weeds, you know, they're, they, they look bad, you know, just let them go. And she said, oh no, Jenny, if we don't handle the weeds in our field, first of all, they, they rob the soil, um, of, uh, nutrients of water, but then she said they can grow so big that they just, um, shade out the crop and then you just lose your entire crop. So from a, from an organic grower perspective, um, while there are a lot more tools, I think now um, you're just dealing with you're you're, you're having to um, deal with your pests differently because some of the tools that you have um, may have in conventional you don't have in organic. So uh, you may be using you know copper or uh, we have a couple of what are called biologics products. So we have um, a serenade which is used from a, a fungicide um, perspective, but also a, a root health perspective, a plant health perspective. So we have products that we sell into the organic market. Um, the majority, though, of our products go to um, conventional growers. And um, on that side as well, um, growers still face pests, that whether it's an insect fungus or a weed that they have to deal with. And on the... Um, conventional side, you know, there are very, very strict uh, rules that go in place, um, put in by the U.S. EPA, not only for the development of products, crop protection products, um, but then also the use. So on every product that's used in the field, there's a label that has to be adhered to, strict adherence. And um, in California, you actually have to have a certified pest control advisor that writes a prescription. So we call them crop doctors in California. You've got to have a crop doctor if you've got a problem on your field that writes a prescription to use a product. So it's it's highly highly regulated, um, and there has just been um, significant improvements too in the efficacy of products and in um, lowering uh, the use of products. And some of that is through the actual formulation of the chemical that you're able to really use a lot less, and then some of it is also new application technologies where you can more precisely apply it. And then um, some of it is just more selective technology that um, creates a product that is more safe to use around pollinators. So a lot on the synthetic side, there's been a lot of um, really great in, um, technological improvements that have happened to, um, to a re- again, from a crop protection perspective, do, do more with less. Right. Yeah, no, and I think really what what I want the listeners to certainly take away from all this information is to know that you can have confidence in all the fruits and vegetables that you see, whether you're shopping at the grocery store or farmer's market, have confidence in your choice to eat a fruit or a vegetable, regardless of how it was farmed. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really insightful and amazing to hear more about what Bayer's doing, um, you know, to develop all of these other, all of these styles of farming. So it's, you know, Jenny, thank you again for 
being part of our show today. You are certainly among the strongest and fiercest female leaders in the fresh produce and ag industries. What is the one thing that you want our listeners to take away from today's show? Well, I would say um, disruption and innovation. Um, I think um, even though I, I have a lot of background and, and family members that have been in ag, um, I think now it is a great time to have disruption and innovation in the fruit and veggie space. So really thinking differently about how we, um, if we think about from a consumer perspective, how we um, showcase our fruits and vegetables to, um, you know, any age group, but li- listening to consumers and what they want and, um, and, and giving them what they want and having it be an amazing experience so that they come back to eating cantaloupe. Um, I think also just talking and think and, and doing different things about how we talk about modern ag. I mean, with that 2% of the population engaged in farming, that means when you're walking around the street every day, most of the time, unless you're at a, uh, a fresh fruit and veggie conference, most of the people have Ha, don't have a connection to agriculture. So I think really taking the message about how your food is grown and what growers are doing, um, all the things that they're doing to be even better stewards of the land, you know, things like no-till and drip irrigation and uh, using data and technology to make better decisions on the farm. I mean, um, we have some technologies that allow um a uh, head of broccoli to come to um, to market sooner, you know, um, and that they have more consistency in the shape of the head so that when a grower comes through the field to harvest, they can harvest 70% of their field instead of 50%. And so they've got less food waste. So I think there's so many good things happening at the farm level too, in terms of um, what we're doing to to make this amazing fruit and vegetable and even, you know, just generally in agriculture, the food that we make, whether you're raising a a cow or um, growing soybeans or or growing lettuce. I mean, there's just a great, great story there. So I'd say two things tell disrupt and innovate. Um, We're such a dynamic industry. Just keep focusing on that. And then um, educate and create this transparency for consumers to, to really understand and appreciate how their food is grown. That's fantastic. Jenny, where can our listeners go to learn more about Bayer and read your blog? Thank you for being part of today's show. I'm going to, you know, we have a tradition where we send the mic back to our guests for the final goodbye. But before you say goodbye, I want to make sure that you let all our listeners know where they can go to get more information. Great. So you can go to cropscience.bear.com. That's our main homepage. But we are we are very, very active on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook. I spend a lot of my time on LinkedIn. So if you want to read any of my blogs, um, go onto my LinkedIn page, Jenny Maloney. And um, also you can follow Bear for just great information on the things that we're working on uh, throughout the world. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I um, I really enjoy listening to your podcast. Um, uh, every time it comes out, I I think that for the entire fruit and veggie industry, there's um, it is such a, a great industry with great people throughout all the different sectors. It's it's an exciting area to be involved in, and um, glad to be a part of it as as bear and. Um, we, can't wait for all the other great things to come. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Produce Moms podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a featured guest, just send an email to Lori at the moms.com. We know there is a Produce Mom in you because there's a Produce Mom in all of us. Join our community on Facebook and all social platforms. Help us change the way America eats. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.